Um, thank you for coming, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This is my great pleasure to welcome you to the open lecture of ESMT. Uh, we have an amazing speaker today, Professor Gigerenza, who is going to talk about decision making uh, under uncertainty. I'm Francis de Vericourt. I am a faculty uh, professor of management science here at ESMT, and the school has been a platform for uh, questions of current interest and, and debate for the past decade, I think, already. Uh, and I need to thank all media partners who are uh, part of this, the Tiger Spiegel and Harvard Business Manager. Um, so we had uh, international leaders coming, uh, sharing their wisdom. We had a very well-known uh, expert and, um, and speakers. Um, and today, uh, it was high time, I believe, that we had a full-fledged topic around decision-making, which I believe is very important, as you know. Uh, Professor Gingranza will uh, guide us into the questions about how real people make real decisions in the real world. So the word real is very important, uh, I guess. Um, and he is the director of the Harding Center for Risk Literacy at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin. Uh, and a partner of Simply Rational, the Institute for Decisions. Uh, Professor Gigerenza is also a member, so get ready for that. He's a member of the berlin Brandenburger Academy of Science, the German Academy of Science, and, and honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Science and uh, the American Philosophical Society. Wow. Um, so it, it gives you an idea of the breadth of his thinking, research, highly interdisciplinary, uh, which I think is a requirement when you do research in decision uh, science uh, or decision making. So throughout his career, he has received uh, numerous uh, awards for his articles and books. Uh, his popular books have been translated in more than 20 languages and I keep running into them at airports, which is probably a good sign because usually at airports in bookstore, they display the book that are selling well. Uh, and he has also written many academic books. Some of them I read during my PhD, so now I feel a bit old to be here long time ago. Um, in particular, he wrote Abundant Rationality with uh, Professor uh, Selton, who is a Nobel laureate in the mid-90s, if I'm correct. And additionally, Professor Gingerenzer has trained US federal judges. I wish you could train also the US politicians, but that's another story. Uh, German physicians and top manager in decision making um, under uncertainty. Now, you know, I could go on and on and on like that. It would take me one hour at least to list all the achievements of our guests today. But it's very important to me that you understand deeply what is the depth of the contributions of Professor Gingerenzer when it comes to decision making. And, and for that, I need to take you back in the early 50s where people truly believe that the human brain, when the human brain made decisions, the human brain would do probability calculus or would follow the rules of logic. And people got excited about it and tried to prove that it was right. In fact, the whole theory of economics was built on that very assumption. But very quickly, some people felt very uncomfort uncomfortable with that idea. And in particular, someone called Herbert Simon, who is one of my heroes, if you want to know. But Herbert Simon, he was also doing some research in artificial intelligence, come up with a very simple but beautiful argument to destroy all that. And he said that even if you want it, to make decisions based on calculus, probabilities, and what's not, it would be impossible for a brain because we simply do not have the cognitive capability for that. We don't have the memories, we don't have the speed. So just, just forget about it. Does not mean we are irrational, but we are bonded in our rationality. And after that statement, it was a defining moment, I believe, in the history of decision making. And after that, uh, in some sense, the field split in many different directions. Some of them uh, disappeared, uh, thanks God. Uh, but they are, I will summarize and simplify two main branches. Uh, the first reactions are, and I'm sorry for my terminology, I don't want to offend you, but the first one are the pessimistic. I would call them the pessimistic, it's my own terminology, so it reflects on my own judgment. And the pessimistic said, oh, we are bonded, we have limited ca uh, cognitive capabilities, therefore we make mistakes. So therefore we must be super bad at making decisions. So what those pessimistic did is that they took people like you and me, put them in the lab, torture them with all sorts of simple decision questions, and again and again and again, they found that, yes, we suck at decision making. We're simply super bad. And the picture was so depressing because they even claimed that not only we are bad at decision making, but there are nothing much we can do about it. Now the optimistic came, 
and uh, they were very uncomfortable with that statement. And basically what they said to summarize, they said, well, of course, you know, you put people in the lab, you come up with some artificial decisions, and of course you will find failures, but who cares? What is important is not how you, we decide in an artificial uh, environment. What is important is how do real people make real decisions in the real world? And basically, after decades of evidence, what the optimistic found is that, after all, we're not that bad. After all, you should not be too afraid of your emotions, gut feelings, intuitions when you make decisions. And the founding father of this branch, the founding father of the optimistic, the one who spent his life for collecting evidence to show us that, is here with us today. So please welcome Professor Gingerhanser for his talk about decision making. <laughs> How to make good decisions, how to deal with risks. If you open a textbook in economics, in behavioral economics, in philosophy, in many disciplines, you will likely encounter the following message. Good decisions follow the laws of logic, the calculus of probability, the maximization of expected utility. And if you don't do that, you end up in a chapter on cognitive illusions and errors. Probability and logic is a beautiful mathematical theory, but it does not describe how most of us actually make decisions, and also not how those make decisions who write these books, as the following story illustrates. A professor from Columbia University had an offer from a rival university. It was Harvard, and he could not make up his mind. Should he accept? Should he reject? Should he leave? Should he stay? A colleague took him aside and said, what's your problem? Just maximize your expected utility. That's what you write in your books. Exasperated, the professor said, come on, this is serious. <laughs> I would like to invite you today into our research on decision-making under uncertainty. That's what this professor was in. And I will explain the difference between risk and uncertainty. I will argue that under risk, optimize, do fine-tuning. But under uncertainty, it's by definition not possible. We need different tools. And I will talk about one class of tools today called heuristics. Then I will go on and uh, give you, um, introduce you to the uh, heuristic decision making of the unconscious way. So that's called what's called intuitions and the problem that yeah, our society has with intuitive judgments. And uh, then I will give you a few examples of heuristics, how one can study them, and most important, the question, can we distinguish situation where a simple heuristic is more successful than a complex strategy and where the opposite holds? That's the question of ecological rationality. That's the most important one. So please don't misunderstand me that I'm here and telling you simple is always better. No. But the religion today is that complex is always better. Big data, another thing. That's here. The real question is, uh, can we have a science that tells us, in this situation, be simple. In another one, do fine tuning. And um, at the end, I will ex go a little bit, in the time I can, into the more mathematical study of ecological rationality so that we can actually then uh, understand why less is more. So that's the program. Are you ready? Then we'll start. The basic distinction that will go through the entire talk is that between risk and uncertainty. Risk is a situation where we have perfect foresight of all the alternatives in the future, their consequences and probabilities. Um, 
An example is, you know, if you visit this evening a casino and play the roulette, you're in a situation of risk. All possible future states are known, so all the numbers that can come up, and the consequences are known and the probabilities are known for certain. In that situation, you do not need any heuristics or any intuition, you just calculate. And also, you don't need to learn anything, um, nor have any kind of particular knowledge. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, after the last financial crisis, the banks have been criticized of playing in the casino, if that would be only the case. So if, as Mervyn King once noted, the, if we... If the banks could play in a casino, they actually could calculate or approximately their risk weights. But the financial world is mostly under uncertainty. And so is most of business and even our personal affairs. We cannot really be know knowing what all the possible states of the future are and their surprises. Just yeah, try to find the ideal, the ideal partner to marry. There will be surprises. So the question now is, what to do under uncertainty? And surprisingly, almost all of economics has restricted itself to situations of risk. At best, it goes into ambiguity, where we do not know the probabilities. We still know everything that can happen and all the consequences. And what I'm going to do today is to encourage you to seriously study how people deal and should deal with uncertainty. And under uncertainty, we need different tools. And they reach from things that Frank Knight, who originated that distinction, came up with. Uh, if you read Frank Knight, he makes a strong point that under uncertainty, that's the only time you can make profit. You can't do it when everyone knows everything. Uh, but if you read in his book, he has no recipe what to do under uncertainty except courage, hmm? intuition. Hmm? But, okay, that's important. So, the same thing uh, if you read Cain's animal spirits, yeah, but he doesn't tell us what they are. And if you read the modern book on animal spirits by Akilov and Schiller, um, there are now five, yeah? but mostly negative things, and that's the, and that's the, go the going back from Keynes, yeah? misinterpreting the tools that work on the answer that might be cognitive illusions, like overconfidence. So, uh, <clears throat> let me start with two concepts. One is heuristics, and one is intuition. And as I will show you, typically, intuition is the unconscious use of heuristics. But every heuristic can be used consciously. So that's, if you read Kahneman's book, uh, he gets it, gets it wrong. Uh, there is no heuristic and unconscious alignment, nor with bad judgment. Every heuristic can be shown to be consciously used and can be trained. And that's important for education and also uh, we can show a situation where it works excellent and where it fails. So what is an intuition? An intuition is, um, you may have seen the uh, dissertation by Albert Einstein. So intuition has recently come under fire, but for Einstein, it was the big force that created his own theory. And intuition is not arbitrary. You need it to have good ideas, and then you need analysis to show whether they work or not. So intuition can be defined as an unconscious form of intelligence that's based on many years of experience. And where you have a feeling about something you shouldn't do or you should do, but you cannot explain it. So the reasons are not in consciousness. And this is very typical for experts. And you can't have good intuition if you have no expertise. So, but intuition, so intuition is 
nothing arbitrary. It's not a uh, sixth sense or something that God gave us. Hmm? It's also not something that only women have. We men also have intuitions. But our society has problems with intuition. And part of the problem is because we are in a society that is that praises explainability instead of efficiency and success. So I give you one example uh, from the uh, world of business. I have worked with many large uh, corporations and asked the leaders how often do you rely on your gut feeling, that means intuition, in important professional decisions? So precisely how often is a decision at the end made huh? in an intuitive way by you or by the group? Leader? And I emphasize at the end because every responsible uh, leader will go through the data. But often the data doesn't speak to you. And if you then feel, uh, based on your experience, that you shouldn't do that, that's an intuitive judgment. Clear? So I give you one example that's just typical. It's um, the managers and the executive board of a large international technology services provider. What do you think? In how many of the important business decisions is the decision at the end an intuitive one? That means you can't explain it, you just feel it. So what do you think? Zero percent, one percent, two, five, ten, more? Eighty. Up. Eighty? Fifty? Fifty is always a good guess, yes. <laughs> so what do you see here? Um, there's you see the hierarchy for the managers into the executive board. The group executives are responsible for yeah, a few uh, billions. Is the, yeah. And there's nobody who says never. Uh, and also nobody who says always. And both is right because you need every tool, use it in the proper situation. On average, throughout the hierarchy, about every second decision is at the end an intuitive one. The same executives would never admit this in public. There's fear. Because if something goes wrong, you can't explain it. I have seen two major techniques in order to deal with the fear of admitting an intuition and also about taking over responsibility. For a gut feeling, you have to take the entire responsibility. And we are living in a society where fewer and fewer people are willing to take over responsibility, not only in business, look into politics and other areas. The, one, the first technique to uh, deal with this situation is to find reasons after the fact. So, for instance, an executive has made an intuitive decision, but then asked an, uh, another of his uh, people to uh, take two weeks and find the reasons for it. And then the decision is presented as a fact-based decision. This is a waste of time, energy, and intelligence, and money. There is a more expensive version of the same thing, is uh, the company hires a consulting firm who then delivers a 200 paper a document where the reasons for an already made decisions are given. The, um, I have given in the last years a number of talks to one of the world largest consulting firm and have used this uh, one of these um, talks to ask the principal whether he would be willing to tell me how often a customer contact in their company consists of 
providing reasons after the fact for an already made decision. He said, Professor Gigerenzer, if you don't mention my name, I tell you, it's every other decision. So just give you an idea about the waste of time and money that is put into justifying decisions after the fact yeah, by data. So the, uh, there's a second technique which costs the companies more. So besides finding reasons after the fact. This is what I call defensive decision making. Defensive decision making means that an executive uh, believes or feels yeah, that option A is the right for the company, but if something goes wrong, then he can't even explain it. So a defensive decision means that the same executive then pursues and recommends an option B, which is second class according to his or her own judgment. But if something goes wrong, he's not so responsible. That's called defensive decisioning. That is, the executive protects him or herself and hurts the own company. How often do you think that defensive decision making occurs in this big international technology service provider? And this is just a typical instance uh, and I have worked with many ducks noted companies. What do you think? How often would executives risk hurting their own company just to protect themselves? Zero percent? One? Two? Fifty? Something more? Twenty? More? Okay. Hmm. More, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'll show you the same hierarchy. What you will see now is that the distribution is different. It's much more flatter. So that means there are stronger individual um, differences between the executives. So there are a few on the left side where the zero is. The question was out of 10 last important decisions, how many were defensive? Uh, zero means never. If you interview these people, they will might tell you, if the company is in bad shape, I'm in bad shape. If the company is in good shape, I feel well. Hmm? So here the identification between the executive and the goals of the company has worked. Hmm? On the other extreme, you see a few who say basically always oh, ever in that case, seven to nine out of every 10 decisions. And this is mostly on the lower levels of the hierarchy. Hmm? On average, through the entire hierarchy, every third or so decision is a defensive one. And you can make a little calculation what that costs to the lack of error culture in a company. Defensive decision-making, the reasons of it are typically uh, a lack of error culture. So a simple distinction is between positive and negative error culture. A positive neg in a negative error culture, uh, errors must never occur. If they occur, you try to get cover them up. Or if that doesn't work, you look for someone who is guilty. And that causes exactly that, the defensive decision-making. Result is that the errors are perpetuated. In a positive error culture, the idea is that errors sometimes occur. If they occur, they are useful information about something that needs to be repaired. So one doesn't look for someone to blame, but something to change. An example for positive error cultures are uh, the uh, cockpit cultures of most uh, commercial airlines, uh, where there are yeah, check up, uh, checklists and where there is a critical incidents reporting situation. Examples for a not so good error cultures are most hospitals. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why uh, it's one of the most dangerous places on earth. 
not just because you're sick, because of the lack of agriculture. The uh, German AUKA estimates that about 17,000 people are killed every year from avoidable error in hospitals. So, uh, <coughs> the um, defensive cultures can be changed by a number of measures. One would be um, models that the CEO, the top managers, uh, would, if they've made an error, they may just have the assembly here and say, I was part of this decision, it went wrong, let's think about what we did wrong, including me, and let's see how we can improve that in the future. Um, <clears throat> there are a number of other measures which I'm not going in here. So, uh, that uh, illustration of this single company uh, makes the general point, which is, we need to take care of uh, ways to deal with the anxiety uh, uh, with respect to making intuitive decisions, taking responsibility, and the two key uh, techniques are finding reasons after the fact, wasting money, and also defensive decision making. And uh, not doing so will slow down innovation. And here is a recipe for you, how to slow down innovation in your own organization. Always mistrust gut feelings. And you can l read that in uh, some of behavioral economics books, yeah? that um, intuition is suspicious in general. Mm -hmm. Demand an explanation for every new idea and promote a negative error culture and lots of documentation to uh, protect yourself. Huh? Some of you might say, yes, that's our world, we cannot different. But already the example about the uh, airlines shows you it can go different. Or just think about what would happen if you would introduce that culture into sports, say soccer. So imagine a Bundesliga game, a player scores a great goal from an angle that you would never believe how it comes. Now the referee runs to the player and says, you explain me how you did it. If you can't, it doesn't count. <laughs> in this way, we would have uh, almost everyone playing in the third Liga. So part of good expectation is to have good intuitions, mm. and not only in sports. And the demand to explain everything mm. and to ignore what you can't explain misses great part of our intelligence. Mm. <coughs> Intuitions often are based on heuristics. What is a heuristic? A heuristic is a simple rule that focuses mostly on one or two or three things and ignores all the rest. You should not use heuristics under in situations of risk, and except for just getting things done because they're not so thing. But under uncertainty, they are indispensable. And that's a difference to what you read in standard economics and also behavioral economics, where the idea is, if you would always calculate your expected utility, always follow probability theory, you would be right, and if you use heuristics, you're wrong. Yeah? That's a big error. Mm. Um, together with the University of Florida, we, do, um, we work on leadership heuristics. I give you only a few examples. A good leader is not characterized by personality traits. That doesn't help you yeah? if someone tells you you are a point in a five-dimensional space. Uh, that's the big five. Yeah? What do you do then? Uh, a good leadership analysis is um, to think of a leader as a, someone who has a toolbox of useful heuristics. Deal with people, deal with, bit, uh, with uh, business. And I give you here a few examples that is from an analysis of the uh, 50 largest companies in the US. And this is uh, obtained by deep interviews and observation of leaders. So 
how to deal with people. Here's one heuristic. Hire well and let them do their job. You can see in this example that a heuristic defines a climate in a company. Hire well is quality and let them do their job is trust. That's very different from how the German universities, I mean the state-run universities, <laughs> are being done. Hmm? And the, for instance, the Max Planck Society, where I work, has this heuristic. Hmm? And that's why we are better than the regular state-run universities. Hmm? Because there is lots of time spent in finding the proper person as a director, and then the director can do what he or she wants. Hmm? So that's the trust part. Hmm? And one is not regulated by short-term planes. Huh? So the all three years you have to write something new, and then you think, what would the reviewers accept? Yeah? And that's a measure to mediocrity. It cuts out the bad things, but it also cuts out innovation. So that's just one example. First listen, then speak is another example, and that refers to the superior, not the inferior. You may remember uh, a well-known accident by a Korean airliner and where, to make it brief, uh, the captain had the wrong idea, the co-pilots and the crews had the right idea, the captain spoke up, the others didn't dare, and, if the and then the crash happened. If the captain would have followed these heuristics and first listened, and then speak, the accident might not have happened. So there are many of those which one can systematically study and on strategy, I just used the last one here. Don't buy financial products you don't understand. So I would say that if everyone before 2008 on both sides of the Atlantic would have followed the simple heuristic, the crisis would not happen as it did. And I also, for I know there are some very prominent um, representatives of the banking uh, industry and supervision here. Hmm? I would also say that a few such heuristics can bring more safety into banking than value at risk computations. Hmm? Well, probably talk about that later. So uh, <clears throat> what I'm now doing after that uh, first part, I will go in a little detail to show how one can systematically study heuristics. And I will deal with a large class of heuristics that's called one reason decision making. Hmm? So these are all heuristics that just use one good reason and ignore all the rest. That would come up as a source of irrationality in the behavioral economics literature, but just wait a moment. Uh, the example I take is, assume there's a large company which has customer bases of maybe 100,000, and uh, they, uh, one wants to target specific customers or send mass mail or just uh, other kinds of targeting. And the task is, so to, to identify those customers who are likely to buy and not send all these mail or special offers to customers who are inactive, who will no longer buy. This is an, uh, a prediction under high uncertainty. So, because there's so many factors. So there are two philosophies about all of that. One is, it is a complicated issue you need a complicated algorithm. That's the typical view. You may guess, it's not my view. Hmm? <laughs> the other one is, uh, it's not about complicated. This is a situation of high uncertainty. That's the point. Hmm? Therefore, and I give you the statistical reasons in a minute, we need to reduce, make it simpler. Not too simple, but simple enough. I'll show you first a typical uh, uh, solution from the perspective of 
complex problems need complex solution. That's the uh, Pareto negative binomial distribution model. I'm not going to do mathematics today with you. You should just see how the problem is approached. Huh? And uh, I put on the, a little bit of mathematics to impress you. Huh? Mm -hmm. If something, if one doesn't understand something, then people are likely to impress. So, so, so I'm not going into detail. But the point is, what you see here is, all kind of assumptions are made in order to optimize. Huh? And whether the assumptions are true or not is unclear and those are not made. You don't start with looking how people make decisions. You start from your uh, ideas about, uh, do you know what a gamma distribution is and an exponential distribution and such thing and make this assumption. So these models are not unreasonable, but they have one problem. There are a number of free parameters and you fit these parameters on data, and you have the danger of overfitting. The more parameter, the greater the overfitting danger. But that's one philosophy. There are many other uh, models of that type, but just pick that because it's one of the most prominent ones. Uh, what's the alternative? The alternative is we are in a situation of high uncertainty. We need to avoid overfitting the past, we need to make things simpler. And one way to find out how such a heuristic could be is to study actual managers, what they're doing. And uh, in three businesses, in the study I'll show you, all of the managers had a version of the hiatus heuristic. It is if a customer has not purchased within mon nine months, classifies inactive, as always well active. The hiatus can be varied. It varies from business to business. I have to, by experience, to tune them. But it's a one good reason heuristic. Everything else is left out. So the frequency of purchases is not in, nor how much or anything else. Now you would immediately say, okay, you need to put that in in order to have a good model. And Maybe everything else you can. That's, but that is only a good idea under risk. If you know that you can know all the conditions, all the probabilities and everything, it's not necessarily a good idea under uncertainty. Under uncertainty, uh, you need to scale down. And the real test here is you can run an experiment. I, show you one experiment by two um, colleagues who believed that the managers could do better because they should use more information. They should exactly use this model here. And I use this because there are cases where people who are in the old kind of mindset but are experimentally minded can see the evidence. In most of the cases, we have only claims that if someone ignores information, that's because of cognitive limitations and little understanding about the issue. So what was the outcome? What you see here are three businesses, Airline, April, CD Now. And the, if you only would have done the Pareto negative binomial illusion predictions, you would say, oh, it's a difficult thing, but we made 74% correct prediction of customer behaviors. In the airline, 75 in the upper L, and 77 in CD now. Hmm? The important methodological point is to do competitive testing. And that's almost absent in most of behavioral economics and economics. And competitive testing also needs, you need to have a model from a different model class. And also, you need the second methodological point is you need to the testing of prediction, not data fitting. Data fitting, in data fitting, the Pareto negative binomial model would have won. That's a mathematical truth because the simple heuristic has only part of the information, it has more and has all the free parameters. That's the same idea that a complex model like prospect theory can, after the fact, explain almost everything, but not predict very well. So what you see here in the airline business, by using the simple heuristic, 
the predictions are better. The same for the upper rel and in CD now they were, the, they were just equal. You just save all this effort about doing this calculation and data collection. You know? yeah. uh, <coughs> the, there, there's a more general point. Hmm? We, uh, when under uncertainty, the collection of big data does not necessarily help. Think about the destiny of Google flu trends. So if you remember in 2009, uh, there was a big fanfare that Google now predicts the influenza-related doctor visits faster and, uh, than the CDS, the uh, Center for Disease Control. And they had about four or five year data and fitted tons of model on this data, did also some prediction, but it's mostly fitting. And then and, uh, when they made prediction, and that's remarkable because most big data application I've seen, there is no prediction there and there's no competitive, only claims. They made prediction and then remember in 2009, there was the, um, the swine's flu. And uh, making flu prediction is fairly easy because in the winter it goes up and goes down. Yeah? And it was outside of the season, missed it. Of course, because it was not in the data it had learned. Yeah? And the, um, so then for years, the predictions were sometimes good, sometimes bad. And in the last two years, they were constantly uh, too high among others because uh, there is no causal theory. So when people started to get interested in, in swine flu, it was not only those who had symptoms who Googled, but also those who were interested. And then the algorithm over, overestimated the thing. Yeah? So there are many of the reasons why um, such uh, fine tuning doesn't work. Yeah? And the, the Google uh, engineers, they, they had for, spent years on fine tuning the fine tuning algorithm. And finally, it was buried. But the message, uh, a few years ago, I was on a conference on big data. And uh, before uh, I gave a keynote and Victor Meyer Schoenberger gave a keynote. He's the author of the big data bestseller. And he gave a very impressive talk with slides where there was the word more, 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 only this word, yeah? but more, more, more. And made the message and, and Google flu trends was the big showcase of success of big data. I gave a talk on when will big data is likely to succeed and when not. Then there was a, um, the moderator, which was a TV moderator, a black guy, was always moving, uh, asked me first on the stage what I think about the, um, yeah, the, the PR for big data that we just heard. I, I thought I'd tell the truth. So I said, um, Mr. Um, <coughs> Meyer Schoenberger has told you half the truth. I tell you the other half, what happened with big data after the few first years that we saw. And, uh, and then uh, uh, the, the only response of his response where he, I gave him many cues, many facts where he could respond was always, Professor Gigerenz has a different opinion than I, we will see what the future brings. And a year later, Google flu was buried. Hmm? So we see that. that. So these ideas here are as important for evaluating big data as for optimization models. What I'm now doing in the last part is to give you briefly an idea why heuristics can be efficient and why what you read in standard behavioral economics misses the point. So that's the standard account. Why do people use heuristic? It's because of the accuracy effort trade-off. So that means heuristic saves effort, just look in one thing, but you have to pay a price. It's the accuracy. You can find this in, in Payne, uh, Johnson, Batman, or in Kahneman's book. If you formalize that, the idea is the total error is a function of bias. That's the systematic difference between the truth and what your model gives and noise. That's it. This is true under risk. It is not true under uncertainty. 
And the uncertainty, there is, if you look into statistic textbooks, there's the bias variance trade-off. Huh? So there is one more component. It's not only bias, but variance. Variance is something like the trembling of your things. I explain that with a picture, so in order to get you the idea, not the mass. So you have two dart boards here. The player on the left side throws consistently too far to the right and down. Hmm? So see that? Yeah. But this player, so this player has a bias. The bias is defined as the, the difference between the average dart and the bullseye. That's the bias. This player has little variance because all these darts are clustered together. Okay? Hmm? On the right side, there is a player who has no bias because on average, the darts are exactly in bullseye, but only on average. And, but has lots of variance. Hmm? So, so you can see that even having a, su a substantial bias can lead you making better prediction than something we start to illustrate. The uh, hiatus heuristic has no free parameters, so all the darts go in the same point. On the right side, you get the variability by having small samples and also many, many parameters. That's basically the idea. That is, in order to make prediction, the story is not about bias, it's rather about a trade-off between uh, getting it right huh? and also don't tremble too much by having this. Yeah? So that's the key idea. If you understood that, then it's very clear that the idea in current behavioral economics that you should get rid of your biases is the wrong way. You should, you need to keep, because there's a, a trade of some bias huh, in order to reduce variance. And having no free parameter, as in the hiatus heuristic with a fixed nine months hiatus, uh, makes bias zero. You have probably a larger variance. But we have tested the hiatus heuristic not only against the Pareto uh, model, but also against logistic regressions and against the most powerful uh, machine learning algorithms like random forest. Same result, same less is more effect. Yeah. You always do better by just looking at one reason in these cases. So let me end with an example from finance. Now we'll apply the same ideas to finance. And um, I'm working with the Bank of England on a project on simple heuristics for a safer world of finance. That makes some people uneasy, but I will try to give the reasons for that. The, um, as you know, the regulations, um, you may have read Andy Halden's talk, The Dog and the Frisbee, and that is based on our research. That's one of the heuristics how a dog catches a frisbee or a baseball outfielder catches a ball. It's very simple. There's no need for these calculations. And it's faster and it's safer. And uh, he has used this as an analogy to the world of banking regulation, where uh, the problem is much more difficult than catching a frisbee. And there's lots of uncertainty not just wind and spin and other things. Yeah? And the key idea is that the current development went from complex to more complex to more complex. So Basel I had about 30 pages, Basel II had over 300, Basel III had over 600, and we are waiting for Basel IV. Mm -hmm. And complexity breeds complexity. As you've just seen from the bias variance dilemma, you need a kind of scale down, and it, it's the message is not make it as simple as, po as as you can, but as simple as possible. It's usually a U-shaped curve. Yeah? Cut it down, and we are working on ideas and testing these ideas. Uh, when in what situation you can make better predictions, say of bank failure, with less 
complicated methods. So for instance, a simple leverage ratio can predict historical bank failures better than a risk-weighted measure, which has more information. And the reason is clear, because the risk-weighted measure have huge variance component of error, and you prefer something simple that has pro uh, probably a larger bias, but the total error is then better. Uh, uh, if that interests you, you can find more here. And it also gives us a vision about banking regulation that I think is important for a democracy in general. Yeah? We need to strive for regulatory models, but also algorithms that we have in, uh, in, in the course of digitalization that are understandable by the public, by people, uh, and also by experts. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's a strong uh, desire for a democracy not to end up in a situation where nobody understands anymore all these algorithms that score us, that regulates us, and all that. We need to insist huh, on transparency and understandability. And often, as you have seen from the example, the more complex models don't do any better in the first place. Hmm? For instance, Google flu trends, it has shown now that a simple heuristic that just looks at three things can outperform the entire big data analysis. The three things are, so it's the prediction of uh, flu-related um, doctor visits is the target variable, and the three things are, the number of fruit-related fruit -related, um, doctor visits two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and since we don't have information about one week ago, we take that from last year. It's as simple as it does better. We have to realize it. So here's the last example on in finance. How to make investment decisions. And all of you who have studied finance have learned the mean variance model. So Harry Markowitz, got his Nobel Prize in Economics for this model. When Harry Markowitz made his own decisions for the time after his retirement, he used his Nobel Prize winning optimization model. So we might think, no, he did not. He used a simple intuitive heuristic, which we call 1 over n. 1 over n means divide your money equally over the n assets. So if you have two, 50, 50, three, three. Uh -huh. Now, then you could say, oh, maybe he has cognitive limitation, but it doesn't work. He, he faucet the model. Mm -hmm. So uh, then, but the real question is, can we show when that works and when it does not work? Mm -hmm. So there are a, a number of studies, for instance, one of the studies, had um, by De Miguel had eight um, investment uh, questions uh, tasks, so one ten American industry funds, and with um, a Markowitz mean variance model, you need data in order to estimate your variances, covariances, and the me expected means, and they had ten years data. With one over n, you're done. You need no data. So 1 over n is the opposite of big data. It's the art of no data. And I think you now understand why no data is just not something laughable. It avoids avoids total variance error. It just had biases. So what was the result of that study? In uh, seven of these eight tests, 1 over n made more money than mean variance by standard criteria like Sharpe ratio. The more interesting question is, can we identify a situation where one over n actually can beat this and where it's the opposite? That's the question of ecological rationality. I'll just give you quickly some of the ideas. On the left side, there is the risk part. On the right side, the uncertainty part, what I've seen for. If you're on the low uncertainty, if you alternate higher model, make it complex, optimize, do big data. On the right side, if there's high uncertainty, many alternative smaller ones, make it simple. It's a kind of key recipe for that. And let me end with the turkey illusion. What's that? Assume you are a turkey. It is the first day of your life. 
a man comes in and you fear he might kill you, but he feeds you. On the second day, the man comes again. You fear he might kill you, but he feeds you. On the third day, the same thing. By all conventional models, such as Bayesian probability updating, the probability that the man feeds you and doesn't kill you increases every day a little bit. On day 100 is higher than ever before, but it's the day before Thanksgiving and you're dead meat. That's the situation. The, per the turkey missed an important causal information. Huh? And we're under uncertainty, Bayesian updating is a bet, a wild bet. Huh? It's not a rational model. I mean, and the turkey illusion is less, uh, I think, a problem for turkeys, but for us people. If you think back about the time before the last financial crisis, the Many financial institutions have their trust in, uh, in the market went up sh this short before when, or the volatility indexes went down short before everything crashed. And why? Because you use the past data. So some of the uh, big firms, they could only predict that the real estate make, uh, market is going up because they calibrated on data where always went up. So that's the same turkey illusion. So let me finish. I talked today about three misconceptions. The first one is heuristics are always second best, complex models are always better. No, that's a big illusion. Second, complex problems need complex solution. You have seen under risk, yes, not under uncertainty. And more information, more time, and more computation would be always better. No. Hmm. And decision making under uncertainty is different from decision making under risk. So the best decisions under risk are not necessarily the best under uncertainty. So if you do market, Markowitz optimization, yeah, if the assumptions are right, and if you have perfect uh, knowledge of your parameter values, it's the best thing you can do. Second, I talked about error cultures. So avoid defensive decisions, build a positive error culture. And I made a plea for take heuristics seriously rather than the sources of all kinds of errors. And at the end, more information, more time, and computation is not always better. Less can be more. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Um, Thank you. We are already running late, but. I suggest I take one question for the audience who wants to, to speak up. Do we have a microphone around here? So the gentleman here raises. Yes. Hello. Thank you very much for that excellent lecture. Um, I have one question around the, uh, what you meant uh, mentioned as defensive decision making. Yeah. So I think this is well known in corporate folklore as uh, the saying, nobody ever got fired for choosing IBM. Is that sort of the, what you're getting at? And maybe this related question, uh, my, I have sort of the feeling that uh, privately owned companies uh, are, yeah, have less, um, do less defensive decision making. They're sort of more courageous than publicly owned companies. Is that something yeah. that is borne yeah. out in research? Yeah, so the, the latter, if I start with the latter, so family companies huh, have, much less problems with defensive decision making, also with admitting intuitive decisions. It's their own money. That's the basic thing. Yeah? And the first question, um, and on the, what is the nature of defensive decision making? Let me give another example uh, to make it clear again. If you visit your, your doctor hmm, and you think that your doctor advises you the best for you, you may be lucky because you have a good doctor, but many doctors do not advise the best for you. They practice defensive medicine. They advise you something that protects the doctor against you as a potential plaintiff, which is usually too much of everything, too many antibiotics, too many uh, unnecessary PSA tests for men, too, too, too much medication and um, even too much surgery. 
So it, it's a clear example. And you can also see that in that case, in the US, because of the tort law, defensive medicine is the rule. Hmm? And over 90% of American doctors admit that. Hmm? But say, I cannot be different. In Germany, in our study, it's may half as much, but it's still there. And it's also clear, it's very important for patients to understand the situation in which they are. Thank you very much. Um, due to, okay, let me take one last promise and then uh, we're already a bit late. So I saw other people raising their heads. No, we're good? Yes, please, do you have the, and then we may conclude. Yeah, uh, thanks very much. I'd just like to go back to the real world um, uh, that you mentioned at the beginning of the, the talk. Are you able to give some more examples of uh, decision-making contexts that really are uh, data-rich, low uncertainty versus you know the uncertainty, which at least in my mind seems to resemble the outside world a lot more? So examples for um, situations which are high on risk and low on uncertainty, that's what you're asking. Almost everything that's studied in the lab by decision theorists, so choices between gambles, lotteries, they're perfect risk. Uh, in the real world, uh, if you have a situation where you have lots of frequency data, the world is stable, then uh, that's a good idea to use Bayes. So for instance, um, say uh, cancer screening is an, is an example. Huh? So there's no reason to assume that the situation of cancer tomorrow will be different from yesterday. There are typically hundreds of thousands of people being studied in randomized trials. You can take that and confidently hope that it bears out in the future. So that's an approximation. There are some. The important thing is to distinguish the two and to start thinking about the data. In, uh, I recently gave a talk um, to an economics group where a very famous economist then commented me and said, I hate the distinction between risk and uncertainty. And the reason was that he has only tools for risk. And we need to be open about that, that we need other tools for uncertainty and take them serious rather than blaming them as some kind of psychology that misleads us. Okay, thank you very much. Let me close here. Uh, thanks for attending and thank you for your presence today among us uh, to come to ESMT to speak to us. Thanks a lot. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.